Engineers and scientists from MIT have been putting their heads together and have just announced a new breakthrough. It is a fuel cell that can store four times as much energy as state-of-the-art lithium-ion batteries per kilogram. It also doesn't require pressurized hydrogen fuel tanks, as it instead runs on abundant sodium, which can be reloaded as solid blocks. And it could soon power the electric planes of tomorrow. As an engineer whose PhD was on electric propulsion, this interested me a lot. So let's see if it can live up to the hype. I'm Ryan Innes, and this is a Zero Deep Dive. This video aims to provide a clear breakdown of this new innovation and see how it can be applied to the transport that shapes our lives. I've read through the research paper multiple times so you don't have to and boiled it down to just the best bits. I respect your time so we'll get straight into the inspiration for this, how it works and how it's getting on in the real world. It's not surprising that fuel cells are a hot topic, as, although estimates vary, air transport is said to make up around 10% of all transport emissions, and burning through fuel makes up around 30% of an airline's cost. Alternatives to jet fuel are therefore appealing from a climate and business perspective. But only if these alternatives are good enough, and getting to good enough is easier said than done. Battery electric flight can definitely work. You can literally take to the skies in a Pipstrel Vessel Electro today, but not for very long, and even regional flights are tough for current battery technologies. New chemistries will boost this quite some way, but sadly, some laws of physics make it harder to go longer and longer distances. Fuel cells are seen as a possible solution, with hydrogen being the main competitor. These systems generally use pressurized hydrogen in tanks as a fuel for the fuel cell, providing electricity to large motors for thrust and exhausting water as a byproduct. However, hydrogen, especially green hydrogen from renewable energy, is quite expensive. It also requires careful storage with heavy tanks due to the high pressures. These problems with range and cost are what MIT's new fuel cell hopes to solve. However, it does come with a few of its own challenges. The fuel cell is made primarily from three layers, sodium on the top, a solid electrolyte in the middle, and a porous nickel-based foam structure on the bottom. What makes this cell different to most others is that the fuel is part of the fuel cell. Normally, hydrogen or similar fuels are kept separately and pumped into the fuel cell. But in this new system, the sodium is part of the fuel cell, and it slowly gets used up during operation. For MIT's fuel cell to work, the sodium metal on top needs to be in a molten liquid state, which happens at around 100 degrees Celsius or 200 degrees Fahrenheit. This allows the fuel cell to work in a very interesting way with some unusual side effects. But before diving into that and the impressive results, if you've ever wanted a brand new electric vehicle, you might be interested in today's sponsor, the Seacan Action Fund. If you're looking for the chance to drive off in a brand new electric vehicle and support a non-profit working for a cleaner environment, I have the perfect opportunity for you. This year's electric vehicle raffle from the Seacan Action Fund is better than ever because every ticket gives you not one, not two, but three chances to win an amazing EV. The grand prize winner gets to pick from six luxury EVs, the rugged Rivian R1S SUV, the powerful Rivian R1T truck, the brand new Lucid Gravity, the sleek Lucid Air, the bold Porsche Macan EV, or the iconic Porsche Taycan. The second place winner will choose between the Hyundai Ioniq 5 or the Volkswagen ID Buzz. And this year, there's a third prize, the reliable Chevy Equinox EV. Only 10,000 tickets will be sold at $200 each, which goes to support the Seacan Action Fund's mission of fighting for cleaner air and a healthier environment. Even better, the group covers state and federal taxes. And tariffs? No problem, they cover that too. Head over to www.evraffle.org to grab your ticket. That's evraffle.org, or check out the description below for three shots to win the EV of your dreams. Okay, now back to the fuel cell, which has the molten sodium metal on the top layer. The middle solid electrolyte is specifically a beta alumina solid electrolyte, which was first developed by researchers at the Ford Motor Company 
in search for a storage device for electric vehicles whilst developing the sodium sulfur battery. The sodium electrolyte allows sodium ions from the molten sodium to pass through it, which leaves the electron to go off and power the electric motors. As the sodium ions flow through the electrolyte, the molten sodium gets used up, depleting the fuel reserves over time. Once the sodium ions are on the other side of the electrolyte, they go into the porous metal foam. Humid air is then pumped through the gaps in this foam and reacts with the sodium ions and the returning electrons, turning into water and sodium hydroxide, which are the exhaust products. Now, I'm no chemist, but sodium hydroxide as an exhaust chemical doesn't sound too good. According to the MIT Press article, sodium hydroxide is a material used in drain cleaner, which probably isn't something I'd mention if I was suggesting we shoot it out of the back of a plane into the ocean, but they do explain this. Apparently, as the sodium hydroxide leaves the plane, it combines with carbon dioxide in the air to form a solid material called sodium carbonate, which in turn forms sodium bicarbonate, otherwise known as baking soda. This reaction captures carbon from the air and the final baking soda product helps deacidify the ocean. Now, I must admit, I am still a little bit skeptical of this as it sounds like a phrase that might have come out of the back of a marketing department, but I could be proven wrong. I'm concerned the localized distribution of these exhaust chemicals may do more harm than good. And if the chemicals don't fully react, we could have drain cleaner in the ocean. But I'm not an expert on this. I did see concerns online about chlorine production too, but it appears that this actually happens during the process to make sodium, and the chlorine can actually be taken or sold for use elsewhere. So that's how it works. Cheap and abundant sodium metal is melted and used as a fuel inside the fuel cell to generate electricity. This diagram shows how the team used a H-cell to combine the three core layers we saw earlier. The liquid sodium is on the right-hand side, a solid electrolyte, or base, is in the middle, and the nickel foam is on the left side, labelled as GDE for gas diffusion electrode. A small nickel tab is also used to collect current from the cell. Finally, air is pumped in at the inlet side, and with that, the cell can operate. This image shows what it actually looked like in the lab, and this one shows it in operation, where the liquid sodium is being used up, and the liquid discharge remains on the left-hand side, which is presumably a dilute sodium hydroxide. Now, I think the results for this fuel cell are really impressive, especially considering this is the first version of the fuel cell. Something worth noting that unlike hydrogen fuel cells and batteries, which weigh roughly the same when fully charged or empty, the MIT sodium fuel cell becomes considerably lighter as the sodium fuel is used up and ejected out of the back, much like with jet fuel in a plane, where the plane is at its heaviest during takeoff and lightest during landing. It is possible to keep the liquid discharge with the fuel cell, however, this does reduce overall energy density as you're retaining that weight. What's interesting with this new MIT cell is that the energy and power density changes depending on how much sodium fuel you load into the fuel cell. More sodium means it can store more energy, so the energy density goes up. However, this also makes it heavier without increasing its power, so the power density goes down. In numbers, the energy density is very impressive, at around 1000 to 1400 watt hours per kilogram, which is considerably higher than lithium ion batteries at around 200 to 300 watt hours per kilogram. This energy density is super impressive, however, they do seem to be a bit low on power. The power density of the test cell we looked at earlier is only 40 watts per kilogram, which means it would deliver about 5 to 10 times less power per kilogram than high energy lithium ion batteries. However, this was only a small scale prototype, and the paper claims a full sized stack would actually deliver much more power, meaning it would only be slightly lower in power than some lithium ion batteries. With some clever engineering and potentially a buffer battery, this would hopefully be enough for the high demands of takeoff for an aircraft. What I did appreciate in the MIT paper was that these energy figures actually include the efficiency of the fuel cell in them, which is said to be around 60%. 
This is important because if you have a fuel that can carry, say, 100 units of energy, but it's only 50% efficient, you're essentially only carrying 50 units of useful energy. Where this sodium fuel cell could really shine, much like sodium batteries, is the cost savings it can offer. The paper predicts the fuel could be as low as half the price of green hydrogen if production ramps up. However, they also say that if you sell the byproducts of the process, for example, the chlorine that is produced when making the sodium, you could end up with even more savings. It seems to me that the MIT team and their partners have cracked a lot of the underlying science for this breakthrough to make the fuel cell work. I think the next steps are to nail down the engineering of getting it into the real world. The fuel cell will need advanced cooling systems to make sure it stays at the right temperature, which will add extra weight. Companies like Zeroavia are already at the engineering phase of their hydrogen fuel cells, solving the real world challenges. So it will be a while until this new idea can catch up. But this is a fascinating concept that has real world potential. It's super exciting and is already being spun out as a startup called Propel Aero. And one of the paper's authors, Professor Yetming Chang, is on the team. He's a veteran of highly successful clean tech startups, which are collectively worth hundreds of millions of dollars. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. It's free and helps the channel a lot. You might also like some of my other videos, like this one on a marine propeller that uses dimples from a golf ball. And as always, thanks for watching.